family goes on vacation. Seemingly in the middle of the night, their daughter goes missing. And one part of the investigation focuses heavily on a window. Now, while you might say, John, we've talked about that case before, we're not talking about Madeline McCann, but we are talking about a lot of similarities between Madeline's case and the story of Nora Corrin. This is a missing poster for Nora Corrin, 15 years old, missing since the early hours of Sunday, August 4th, and that's 2019, from Doosan Hotel, Seremban. Nora is around five foot two inches tall and of slight build with brown hair and brown eyes. Let's learn about where this is taking place. This is in Malaysia. Malaysia is a country in Southeast Asia, consists of 13 states and three federal territories separated by the South China Sea. Kuala Lumpur is the national capital and largest city. The economy has traditionally been fueled by its natural resources, but is expanding into the sectors of science, tourism, commerce, and medical tourism. Of course, travel, a very big part of today's story as well. So I wanted to stop at travelsafe-abroad.com and share just a little information about Malaysia in particular, because one of the things we're wondering is, is this possibly an abduction? Um, and unfortunately, Nora is no longer with us. So is this even worse? Is this abduction turned homicide? So how safe is Malaysia really? Malaysia is relatively safe to visit. Violent crime rates are low, so getting mugged, kidnapped, or assaulted is unlikely. But robberies and assaults do happen, sometimes even involving weapons, so it's best to be wise. Malaysia's greatest safety issue is petty crimes, such as pickpocketing, purse snatching, and other types of petty thefts. There have even been reports of criminals using sharp knives to cut the bag from a tourist or a passenger. So... Generally, according to this article, pretty safe. If you're just kind of smart about where you keep your valuables, you're probably going to do okay visiting Malaysia. Unfortunately, that's what this family thought as well, and they came home without their daughter. Uh, so here you can see the Dusan Resort, uh, just a little bit southeast of Kuala Lumpur and a little northeast of Saramban. Let's learn about the case. There is an excellent timeline that's been put together over at channelnewsasia.com. So August 3rd, 2019, Nora, 15, who lives in London with her French father and Irish mother, arrives in Malaysia for a two-week holiday with her family. Her family includes two other younger siblings as well. They check into the Dusan Resort, which is a 30-minute drive from the state capital, Seremban. August 4th, so literally they show up one day from what i understand i think they went for a walk around the area but her father was pretty tired uh, i think he was on a 19 hour flight at this point uh, so i don't think they did a whole lot that first day they go to bed they wake up the next morning august 4th nora's family discovers she is missing at 8 30 a.m the window in the room where nora was sleeping is found open the teen's disappearance is reported by the resort owner after one of Nora's family members informed him she was missing. A search team of around 120 people that include firefighters and police officers is deployed to look for the teenager. Um, we're talking rainforest, very dense vegetation area. You can actually see a photo of it down here. So um, pretty tricky search, pretty tricky search effort we're talking about just right from the get-go. Uh, Nora has a condition. Um, basically, it has limited the growth of her brain. She has limited verbal communication and cannot write more than a few words. Her mother, I, I saw an interview with her mother where her mother also talks about Nora's motor skills and that um, she's not extremely steady when she's walking. Sometimes she needs help. That's going to become a little bit of a point of contention as we move forward with the investigation. But uh, August 5th, more search personnel are deployed to look for her. The Irish Embassy in Kuala Lumpur says it is providing consular assistance to Nora's family. Nora had traveled to Malaysia on an Irish passport. August 6th, police classify her disappearance as a missing persons case and are not treating it as an abduction, but the girl's family tell the Lucy Blackman Trust, a UK charity that supports the families of British people who go missing abroad, that they suspect foul play. So right off the bat, families extremely worry this is a foul play situation. 
police not treating it that way. This is a story that we seem to report on this channel very often. And admittedly, there is decent reason for that. A lot of these missing person cases get solved rather immediately, and they never turn out to be criminal investigations, even though the family might claim that from very early on. Uh, there usually has to be some strong indicator that there was some criminal activity. But here, we've got a little bit of an interesting situation. The bedroom she's sleeping in, she's actually sleeping in with her two younger siblings. Um, we do have some questions about the window being open, and we're going to get into much more detail about that. But we're not hearing of any signs of a potential struggle. We're not hearing that there are marks that could be found outside that show someone being dragged away or people that are close to this that are talking about hearing screams. Several of the indicators that we would hear about in a foul play situation, so far we're not hearing about in this case. So it's one of those things where my heart always wants to lean towards the family. And if, if they're concerned about an outcome like that, I think that those things should be looked at and considered as well. But also in, an, in a missing persons case like this, time is of the essence. You've got a big, dangerous possibility here with the territory. I mean, if she went walking off on her own, who knows what could happen to her out there um, and how difficult it is to find her. So it's one of those things where I wish we had infinite resources in a case like this. I wish that there was some way where, hey, yeah, go ahead and assign a few detectives, start the criminal investigation, and then let's also get um, community support or get search and rescue teams together and then start the search at the same time. We're going to see some information that that's probably not too far off of what actually happened, although... Her family's being very clear, even up to today, that they feel like the police response was not what they would expect. Uh, they complain about a dog, a, a sniffer dog that was brought that they said was extremely old, that basically they, they could just tell. I mean, he, the dog looked tired and the dog was ineffective, uh, even in just trying to lock onto her scent from the actual place where they were known to be. So... Um, the family raises very good questions. I don't want to try to take anything away from that. And there's really some big questions when Nora is found that are raised as well. But uh, is there a full criminal investigation going on right off of day one on this? I don't think so. It seems like it takes a couple days before they start taking some of those steps. August 7th, Nora's father, Sebastian, says his daughter did not wander off on her own. We believe she may have been abducted. The family, in a statement, say Nora never went anywhere by herself, and they have no reason to believe that she wandered off and got lost. We're especially worried because Nora has a learning and developmental disability and is not like other 15-year-olds. She looks younger, she's not capable of taking care of herself, and she won't understand what's going on. By some reports that I'm seeing, they're saying that she has the mental capacities of approximately a six-year-old. Malaysian authorities say the local community, including the Orang Asley people have volunteered to join the search mission. For the first time, police say they are not ruling out any possibility, including criminal elements in the case. So keep in mind, this is now on the 7th. So kind of what I was saying about a few days seem to pass before the investigation switches gears. This timeline is kind of lining up with that as well. Forensic experts retrieve fingerprints from the window pane of Nora's bedroom where she was last seen. I think that's going to be an important component going forward as well. August 8th, the search team uses a recording of Nora's mother calling out, Nora, Nora darling, mummy's here through loudspeakers. Effectively, the investigators um, came to, to learn that Nora was extremely responsive to her mother. They thought it's a good idea to get a recording of her and to go out through loudspeakers, blasting that, trying to get Nora to come to them. Uh, they also did record a few of the other family members and were working in those tapes as well. Police say they believe the girl is still in the area of the jungle where the search has focused. We get to August 10th, and you can see the, the wear that is on this family's face. Nora's mother, Maeve, thanks the hundred strong search party for their efforts in looking for her daughter. Police also confirm they are looking into people with criminal backgrounds around the area and have searched the homes of hotel employees. 
So being a total outsider looking at this, it seems like some of the checkboxes are getting hit for the criminal investigation. The family's main point is there's that gap. There's that gap of several days there. And is it possible there was some evidence that was available in that time frame that wasn't available by August 7th or August 10th or whenever these extra steps are now kicking in? Um, which, of course, I, I think that's that's a very valid concern. Um, particularly because, and we're, we're going to get into more details about environmental factors out there as well. Uh, August 12th, several police officers from England, France, and Ireland are helping local police in the investigation, says Malaysian authorities. The search area has been extended to a six kilometer radius. And then unfortunately, August 13th, rescuers find the body of Nora on Tuesday afternoon after a 10 day search. Very interesting story in terms of how she's found as well. Uh, her family identifies her remains at a hospital morgue later that evening. At a news conference, Deputy Inspector General of Police Maslin Manzor says Nora's naked body was found beside a small stream about two and a half kilometers from the Doosan Resort. Where are her clothes? And what else can we learn about the discovery? Uh, let's go ahead and continue with some more information over at independent.ie. A post-mortem found she had most likely died from starvation and internal bleeding after spending about a week in the dense rainforest. There were no marks or struggle, uh, signs of a struggle on her body, and there was no evidence that anyone had inflicted any violence upon her. Uh, I would take that to mean that they probably checked um, for ligature marks, things like that, uh, broken hyoid bone, um, any signs that, you know, she might have been attacked in that way outside of the obvious, you know, obvious wounds that would, would be in her skin. Both the Irish and French police who were present at the postmortem were satisfied with the work of the pathology team. Police Chief Mohammed Matt Youssef said authorities had found no evidence of foul play. And the postmortem also found she had not been sexually abused. The only marks on her body were visible abrasions on her feet. She wasn't sunburned and there were no mosquito bites. Kind of interesting because um, so far the information is really pointing towards it seems like she might have left on her own, went wandering off. We have this question of what happened to her clothes. We don't even know at this point uh, what clothes she was wearing, but I can tell you from information I found out later, uh, she was sleeping just in her underwear, but once she's found, her underwear is missing as well. Um, but we're talking Malaysia. I've never been there, but I did look up just a little bit of the temperatures that are going on there. For her to be out there walking around for possibly five to seven days, in temperatures that are reaching highs of 90 essentially for that whole week. Um, I mean, I guess it's possible that because of the foliage and because of the cover from the sun, maybe she's not getting sunburned, but she is extremely fair skinned. Um, it, it's a bit of a question, but the other thing in my mind is wondering about her clothing. Of course, one of the things that always comes up when a, a body is found and clothing has been removed is paradoxical undressing. Uh, which is where someone that's suffering from hypothermia essentially feels like their skin is burning and they wind up removing their clothing. Well, look at the temperature, the temperatures that we're talking about here. Lows in the mid 70s, basically for that whole week. So I don't think she got to a point where she was ever freezing. I don't think that that's a factor in terms of her clothing. Her father's commenting here. Um, this doesn't fit the argument that she was out in the jungle by herself for seven days. No mosquito bites. Uh, no bad injuries to her body. I am seeing some notes. There were some light scratches around her legs, maybe some light bruising, but nothing that you would expect um, for someone that is, I mean, you saw that, that terrain's pretty rough out there. And the reports that we have, at least from her mother, of uh, her ability to get around not exactly easily. Can you really see her going through that type of terrain and not hurting herself severely in some way? That's kind of... The conclusion they come to when they find her body. Malaysian police insist there was no sign of foul play and authorities closed their inquiries within days of the discovery of her body. However, Nora's parents believe she was abducted and they fought doggedly for an inquest. Nora's parents are convinced she could not have reached the spot where she was found without another person. Uh, had she gone three meters, she would have tripped and seriously hurt herself, said her father. There was total darkness 
There was not even any moon that night. I think he's raising a bunch of good points. And of course, they push for an inquest, and I can tell you they do get that inquest. It's actually going on right now. A lot of the additional sources we're going to cover today are information that are coming out from the inquest, but it's still not done. Um, so I wanted to share this with you guys at this point, kind of bring you up to speed on it. I think we're going to have an update episode where we get into the additional details. Um, I'm very surprised because the inquest was supposed to run until September 4th. It's still going. So obviously there's a lot of information that's being considered. And uh, I, I knew we were going to have to do this in more than one episode. Also, very quick thank you to James for sending me some information about the inquest as it was going on and kind of prompting me for this case. I actually remember Nora when she went missing. You know, I'm hooped in with all these missing persons organizations, and I remember her poster kicking around. But James was kind enough to send me a little nudge on this and say, hey, you know what, John, this is looking kind of odd and um, you might want to talk about this. Maeve and Sebastian Corrin have sued the Malaysian resort for alleged negligence, citing a lack of security at the resort and a window found ajar with a broken latch found on the morning of their daughter's disappearance. Um, uh, just off the basics of that case, I, it sounds to me like they've probably got a pretty strong one, at least for some type of negligence on the resort's behalf. Um, if you're going to have children sleeping in a room like that and you can't lock the window or make sure that they're safe in that room. I, I think that's that's pretty a pretty reasonable expectation. Though culturally, what I'm seeing about this area is uh, this is the type of place where you want to leave your window open. They don't have air conditioning in these rooms. The humidity is like 99% today, I think, when I was checking the weather. Very humid, but they expect that that's what people are going there for, to appreciate the warm air and the humidity. They said the inquest will be crucial in determining the fullest possible picture of what happened to Nora and how her case was dealt with, according to the Associated Press. So the inquest did start. Here's an article from August 24th, 2020. So essentially almost a year later, Malaysia opens the inquest. A Malaysian coroner opened an inquest on Monday, August 24th, into the death of a French-Irish teenager a year after her unclothed body was found in the jungle following her disappearance while on holiday. Malaysian police insisted there was no sign of foul play. Authorities classified the case as requiring no further action, but her parents pushed for the inquest and authorities agreed. Coroner Maimuna Aid said, we are here to answer a few questions. Who is the dead person, when and how she died, and whether anyone was responsible? 64 witnesses are expected to be called. And as of when I'm recording this right now, I think they've only gotten about halfway through that. The teenager's Irish mother and French father were not present at the inquest because of the coronavirus pandemic. They will be interviewed by the coroner on a video conferencing platform. Other expected witnesses include police, hikers who found her body, and a British forensics expert who will join by video link. And if you do search on Nora's name in YouTube, you're going to see a lot of postings, I think by the star, that are essentially little clips of different moments that are happening at the inquest because it's, it's kind of like a Zoom call. Um, so they're basically just taking clips about particular facts and rolling those out. I didn't see that those videos were getting a whole lot of attention, so that's also part of what motivated me here to kind of pull all this information together in one place and, and try to give you guys a, a more concise view of what's going on with this. Over at today.rtl.lu, Malaysia police tell inquest no sign that the French-Irish teen was kidnapped. Senior police official Mohammed Matt Yusup said, We did not receive any telephone calls. Usually in this kind of case, we'll get a call to say the victim has been kidnapped and is in the hands of certain people and they would demand a ransom. I believe the missing person actually climbed out of the window, Muhammad added. I haven't been able to find great pictures around this. I saw some pictures and they were uncredited, so I'm not really trusting. I don't know if they're accurate or not. They were pictures of a window that was actually on a floor level, but the description that I'm getting from the articles, and maybe this will change as we go through them again, is... It's like a two-story room or um, apartment bungalow. And the kids were upstairs and the parents were downstairs. So that's another kind of bizarre consideration for me. Um, 
is she really going out of a window from a second story? And, you know, being someone that has issues with, uh, with their motor skills possibly, uh, as well. It, there's, I don't know. Um, the pictures I saw, it was weird because they were of a window that was in an obvious kitchen area and it was so low that literally you could push the window open and step through it. Like it was a door. I don't think that's the right one. So if you guys are finding different photos, uh, that make more sense that have, a decent credit of where they're coming from on them, please share that with me. I wasn't able to find it before I started rolling today. A second witness, resort owner Hanum Ahmed Bamadhaj said the latch of the window the teen is believed to have climbed out of was broken and there was no CCTV at the site. Two windows from the bungalow were shown in court, one of which had a broken latch. Um, yeah, I wish I had those photos or that they could have dropped them in these articles, but they didn't. Continuing at thesun.ie, once again, the resort owner who testified via video conference said Nora's parents had told her the teen only had on underwear when she went missing and that she would hide when she was frightened. Recalling the night, Hanum, whose house faces the cottage the Quarrens were staying in, said it was peaceful and that her dog, who would bark if there were outsiders, was also quiet. Now, that causes a few problems in my mind as well, because if the dog would bark, if there was outsiders and you're talking about the house literally facing where they were staying, wouldn't the dog have barked if Nora slipped out a window, went walking by there? I just, it's tough because once again, I don't have a, like an overview. I don't have a layout where we can, I mean, it could be that there's a considerable distance between these two buildings. But it's interesting to me that the resort owner is kind of using that as a logical point of, well, if there was intruders, my dog would have barked. You know, if someone was going that direction, my dog would have barked. But if a 15-year-old is leaving and the 15-year-old is clearly an outsider to the dog as well, dog isn't barking. I don't know. She acknowledged that a window of the cottage found ajar the morning Nora disappeared was faulty and could be opened from the outside. But she said there have never been any criminal break-ins on her property since it opened for business 11 years ago. Nora had poor motor skills and needed help to walk, and her mental age was about five or six years old, her parents said in the lawsuit. The lawyer for Nora's parents questioned the police chief about the state of their daughter's feet. She was found naked. Here it says a kilometer, but we know it's more like two and a half uh, away from their villa in rough terrain with no shoes, but with no cuts on her feet. The lawyer said uh, she was found unclothed without footwear, yet there were no serious scars or injuries to her soles. The police boss agreed, adding no, only some minor bruises. They heard that apart from insect bites, there were no serious visible injuries. So that's kind of interesting, too, because that's different than the information we heard previously. Well, previously they said there was no mosquito bites. Here we're hearing that there was some form of insect bites that were found on her as well. Um, that's just another thing in terms of reviewing the stories. I'm, I'm starting to see certain points that are kind of flip-flopping from one article to the next. Uh, the manager said the gate... So there's a gate that's there also is locked at night, but the fencing for the gate is not properly complete. And that kind of raised another point too. I saw in a different article where they were saying if she had walked through areas, I guess part of the fencing is actually broken, but it's so broken that they were saying if she had tried to walk through those areas, she certainly would have cut her foot. Um, so how did she get clear of, of that fence? I don't know. Asked about the lack of street lighting, she said, we try to not have too much light pollution because we want to see the stars. Which, you know, I, I understand. And we're talking, it's, it's, that's why we take vacations. We go to experience different cultures where different things are important. I totally understand that. But when you have children that are going there, I think there has to be some basic safety concerns. If you don't want lights on because you want to see the stars, I can kind of understand that, but how about some motion sensors, you know, put up some lights that have motion triggers on them, uh, or at least have some CCTV going that has infrared lights built into it, something along those lines. There's a way to address both safety and well, security and safety, I guess. The whole idea of the Doosan is that the houses are open to the view. You can feel the fresh air from the jungle inside the house. We don't have TV, said the resort owner. 
Even I sleep with my room door ajar at my family villa, she added. Over at today.rtl.lu, senior police official Mohammed Noor Marzuki Basar, who played a key role in organizing the search for the schoolgirl, said Tuesday that her London-based family believed she was in one of three houses near the Doosan Resort. We searched the houses but didn't find anything. The teen's family had also told police at the time that she could not walk more than 20 feet about six meters on her own, Marzuki said. As well as the houses, a team searched a hut deep in the jungle after the resort owner said the girl could have been taken there, but they got there and they only found a man sleeping at the site, he said. Now that comment about Nora not being able to walk more than about 20 feet seems to become a point of contention, especially during the inquest here at MalayMail.com. Search area expanded after CCTV footage showed teen could walk unaided. Uh, Marzuki said, based on footage of the family's arrival at KLIA, the local airport, if I'm not mistaken, they could be seen heading towards a particular location together to wait for someone to arrive to pick them up. In the footage, the missing person could be seen walking normally with her luggage, like anyone of her age. After viewing the footage repeatedly, Maud Nor Marzuki said it was then decided that the search area was to be significantly expanded from between four and six square kilometers previously to a 20 square kilometer radius toward the nearby Ganung Barembun on the eighth day of Quarren's disappearance. Asked further to provide his own conclusion as to why Quarren was not discovered during the three days the search zone overlapped with her final location. So get that, guys. Like, they were literally searching where she was found. Marzuki said there was an assumption that she was still active and moving, with the possibility that she was no longer at the final destination when rescuers scoured the place. And when you're talking about this type of time frame, so that's certainly a, a, po- a possibility, uh, extremely unfortunate to think of that you would have, you know, searchers going through that area and then a day or two later, she actually winds up there. But the reality of it, it, it certainly could be that. Over at BelfastLive.co.uk, the parents of Nora Corrin revealed fingerprints had been found on the window their daughter was supposed to have climbed out of in Malaysia. When quizzed by their lawyers, a police boss involved in the search confirmed fingerprints had been lifted from the window pane, but said he had not been briefed about the results. At least he wasn't briefed. Thankfully, we do have someone that has that information. That'll be coming up soon. Over at the Irish Sun, more information from Marzuki. After returning from the hospital, I held a meeting with my search team because the family previously disclosed to the investigating officer that Nora Ann was clad in her underwear the last time she was seen, and the body that we found was naked. So there was a lingering question on the whereabouts of her underwear. Marzuki said the search for the missing underwear resumed at 8.30 a.m. on August 14th, 2019. So once again... Uh, at least at this point, they are taking criminal element considerations in and and acting on those. Uh, Now they're trying to find the underwear even after they have found Nora. Despite their efforts, he said the search team failed to find any trace of the girl's underwear and the large-scale operation was called off by day's end. One of the hardest things to try to understand about this case is if you believe there is a criminal element that's going on here, what's the motive? And and I think it's fair when the police say, hey, look, we didn't get any phone calls. We didn't get any ransom demands. Now we're going to find the family actually did have some contact of that nature that happened a few days later. But with cases like this, you're always wondering, is that happening because of the news exposure around this case? But there's another very interesting development that happened here as well over at mirror.co.uk. Stranger approached Nora. A stranger approached London schoolgirl Nora Corrin after her family arrived at Kuala Lumpur International Airport, an inquest heard. Her dad, Sebastian, had left Nora and her two younger siblings unaccompanied for less than five minutes. He had gone to meet their mom, Maeve, who had flown in separately from Singapore after a business trip. The dad had arrived in Malaysia first on August 3rd, uh, flown from London with the children, A female police officer told the inquest how the dad and children had waited. Dad moves just 30 steps away to meet mom at the arrival gate while Nora and her younger siblings, who are aged 12 and 8, 
were left alone briefly. He kissed his wife when she walked out, and they immediately returned to their three children. In the meantime, the three siblings standing alone were approached by an unknown male. The youngsters ignored his approaches, as they've been warned to not speak to strangers. Assistant Superintendent Chong Mi Chiai told how after Nora went missing, a family friend had received anonymous WhatsApp messages saying they had been followed from the airport and Nora was still alive. Police seized CCTV footage from the airport. Obviously, we know that they were looking at that to see Nora's walk, but they also looked specifically for this person that approached the children. Uh, A camera showed an unidentified individual walking up to the children, spending a couple of seconds with them. The children told us the man whom they did not know said hello and wanted to know where they were from. He left after the children ignored him. So I don't know if there's a whole lot to that. Um, She continued, I arrived at the resort on August 4th and got down to speaking to Nora Ann's mother upon learning both had a very close bond. Soon after they arrived on August 3rd, Nora Ann went on walkabout towards the deer enclosure and returning informed her mother she was attracted to the animals. So basically, um, we have the female police officer here saying she had spoken to Nora's mother and heard this story that they did go out for a walk the first day they were there. Nora saw some deer in an enclosure and was attracted to them. And I just, I'm really trying to point that out in particular, because I think the officer is trying to include that as a possibility of what could have motivated Nora to leave her room. Um, You know, maybe she wanted to try to get back to the animals. She leaves the bungalow, gets lost in in the forest. I, I think in terms of the things that we're looking at in this case, I think that's reasonable. I think it has to be considered. Uh, There's still big concerns around all this. The the missing clothing is a major one. Lack of marks on the body, another major one. That supports this theory that there could have been an abduction, that someone might have moved her. And that would explain why her feet weren't all marked up from almost a week of walking around in the forest. And the coroner estimates that she was likely dead somewhere between three and four days before their discovery. So that would put her out there for five days, maybe possibly six days of her in a jungle of that nature with the markings that they're describing, which I don't know. It it doesn't seem very logical. It seems like there's something else. It would make more sense to me If the estimation of death was pushed back considerably and they were saying, yeah, Nora seemingly snuck out of the house. There was a terrible accident. We found her. She had this big head wound. Um, There was no really no other marks on her body, but we know that she probably had passed away within that first day of, of being out on her own. That's not what we're hearing. We're hearing that she was out there for five, six days and yeah, we've got no real substantial cuts in her feet. Her clothes are missing. There's just, I I understand why the parents are stuck here. I understand, at least from what the investigation's presenting, why they feel stuck too. And I don't know where the truth is in this. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the inquiry is going to help flesh more of that out for us. But uh, let's continue. We've still got a few kind of big points to cover before we're done with this phase of the review of the inquiry. Head of Forensics, Noor Idora Sedan, told the hearing during the 10-day search for Nora, DNA samples were taken from her siblings, Ennis and Maurice, and her parents, Maeve and Sebastian, for comparison. The lawyer for her parents asked, We know that she had died four days prior to being found in the flowing stream, so would DNA remain on her face and naked body? Ms. Sedan replied, DNA in time will degrade and be lost. However, in the case where a body is found, generally it is suggested that the outside of the body, definitely foreign DNA, is difficult to find due to the environment. Uh, Yeah, I don't know if she was partially submerged in the stream, um, but with that level of humidity that we're talking about out there and that type of heat, 
uh, I imagine that that would be very damaging to DNA evidence. And it seems like the experts kind of stating that as well. Malaysia is hot and humid. Therefore, DNA degrades very fast as compared to four season countries. Having said that, the swabs taken in intimate areas outside or inside of the body, no foreign DNA was found as well. In short, we've done the analysis as thoroughly as I could, and we could not find any foreign DNA on the body, she said. But we've got pretty big considerations in terms of environmental factors that could be affecting that search. So that's another one of those where it's like, I'm, I'm looking for something to push the needle and it doesn't. It just kind of leaves it right in the middle for me. Uh, more information at belfasttelegraph.co.uk. Nora Corrin Inquest told no trace of drugs found in teens system. I think they're basically just trying to check off all the boxes with the investigation at this point. A drug analysis conducted on the three specimens obtained from Nora's remains, including her liver, found no traces of common drugs. They also performed a pesticide analysis. I don't know why. I don't know if that's used as a poison or, or something to knock people out, but they didn't find any traces of pesticide as well. Uh, back to MalayMail.com. Back to the fingerprints. This is one... For me, the fingerprints are a very important component because they could really help tell a story. If we see Nora's fingerprints on the window, trying to prove that she, it's it's difficult because it's still not quite a slam dunk in terms of she left the, the house of her own accord. It helps support that because you could see, okay, she touched the window, but she's staying there for the night. You know, she might have touched the window earlier. So that's why it's not a total slam dunk, but it would help support that perspective. Are we going to get that? Uh, eight fingerprints were lifted from a window. Assistant Commissioner Hassan added that the fingerprints were lifted on August 4th, 2019. Um, so that's one of the things, basically, he's saying that the fingerprints were lifted on the day that she was reported missing. Uh, and that's one of the things that for me looks like an indicator of, yeah, maybe they weren't in full criminal investigation mode at the time, but someone there was thinking about the possibility because they were lifting prints the same day of that missing persons report. We managed to obtain eight fingerprints from the window frame and 20 samples taken from family members, workers, former workers, and workers in an adjacent resort for our comparisons. The results, which I informed of which I was informed of on August 6, 2019 on the eight samples were as followed. Four of them had inadequate features while four more were in suitable condition. Essentially four of them weren't the right part of a fingerprint. They were like, you know, if, if the tip of a finger had touched it or the side of a finger. So they weren't good for comparison, but four of them were. Of the four that we compared with the 20 samples we obtained, only one matched. It was Nora's mother. The other three are unknown. Now, what's interesting to me is it sounds like they did a very logical approach to the fingerprint analysis, especially trying to get the, the workers, people that would interact with that window on a regular basis. Um, and not, not to necessarily rule them out. That could also support that, hey, this person seems to have been in that room. Is that a normal part of their job? Like maybe that would turn out to be odd. But we've got three other prints there that are good enough for analysis, but they're not matching anyone. Now, there's a little bit of a strange twist here because of Nora herself. Quote, even after she was found in a sample taken, there was no positive result as her prints have shriveled due to the exposure of her body to the environment. Um, which when I heard that, I was like, why are they going off those prints? They have to have other prints for her. This is a young woman that just traveled internationally. I don't, like, I'm pretty sure out here just to get a passport, you've got to be fingerprinted. Um, another window near the attic where Corin had slept was also checked for fingerprints. Eight more fingerprints were lifted, but none was complete enough to use for a comparison. Apart from fingerprint dusting, they also did a luminol check. It was applied throughout the general areas of the house. And then we get this very strange quote here. At that time, we also managed to obtain blood evidence in the form of blood drops in the washroom. But whose blood it belonged to, I am not at liberty to say. And then he actually continues to say, maybe you should ask the lead investigator. I don't know why that comment is phrased like that in that way. Um, 
I don't know if they're trying to allude to the fact that there's something else going on here, something within the family or something of that nature. That comment just uh, really kind of hits me sideways. I, I, I don't know what that's about. And unfortunately, I haven't found any other information that really links up to that to help explain it. So I already told you about, you know, one of the dogs was seemingly so old that the family was kind of concerned about it and it really wasn't effective. Um, there, there was, I found article after article about that. There just wasn't much to actually share about it. But there was other dogs that were brought in as well. Trained sniffer dogs searching for missing teenager Nora Corrin tracked her scent to an abandoned fishing hut near a pond. But the detection dogs failed to pick up a scent at the villa window where police believe that she actually climbed out of it in August of last year. And what's interesting is that kind of matches up with the first dog that was brought out there um, because they were trying to get that dog to start from the window also, and it just, it wasn't happening. So here we have dogs that actually do pick up on her scent, but they pick up on it outside. When, When they're inside, they're not, they're not tracing her at that actual window. And it, it raises a question for me about why are we assuming that it's the window? Like, why why assume that? Isn't there a possibility that she came downstairs and went out a different way? Um, if that picture that I saw is actually a picture of the lower kitchen window, that'd be a very easy place to step out. But also just a door? Like, I, I don't know why we're so focused on that window. It's a bit different than in the Madeline McCann case um, where... You know, the location of that window, the alley that's behind it, the prints that are found outside of it, the the shutter or security system that looks like it's been pushed. There's there's a lot of different things that are drawing you to the window in Maddie's case. In this one, I don't quite understand why it's such a focus. Uh, back to the information about the dogs. The inquest heard dogs picked up her scent on the other side of a small picket fence at the Rainforest Echo Resort where Nora and her family were staying. It led for almost a mile to a dilapidated hut. A cadaver dog was also used at the hut, but failed to pick up any scent. That suggests that she was alive when she actually got to that location. The canine trackers were given uh, material, and the material that I've seen as it's described is uh, some type of cloth that her mom had. I don't know if her mom took like a shirt of hers that she had worn recently and then cut that up or something, but her mom was providing a sample for all the dogs. Um... So they gave that material to the dogs and they said the dogs seemed to go nowhere when they were at the actual villa and they just, they weren't making any detection in the actual room. So then they took the dogs outside and that's when they got them to hit at the rear section fence. Uh, That took them to the abandoned shack near the fish pond and there, unfortunately, the trail was lost. Uh, He was asked by Nora's parents' lawyer how high the fence was and told that the fence was about waist high. It was less than 100 meters from the villa window. Earlier in the inquest, the property owner said a section of the fence had been brought down and needed repairing. Um, Now that we understand it's a picket fence, that might make a little more sense in terms of if there's a part of it that was broken, why it might be dangerous for her to step through it. Um, There could be nails that are pointing up, but also the pickets themselves. The officer said that between the window and a fence at the rear of the villa, the dogs failed to pick up any scent. So that's another important consideration. They get her at the fence, but they're not getting her at the window and they're not getting her anywhere between the actual bungalow and the fence. Very, very odd. And earlier I told you guys, um, sort of unbelievable in terms of how she was found. Listen to this. Siamese monk pointed us to where missing teen was. Hiker testifies. Search and rescue operation volunteer Chong Yu Fat was asked to explain why his group, comprised of experienced local hikers, had decided to search the area where Quarren's body was eventually found. I heard from Chan, our group leader, that he had contacted a Siamese monk and the monk instructed him to look for the girl near areas with a river. After two days of searching, Chan still hadn't found anything but passed a river on his way back which is why he returned to the area on the third day. There was also a makeshift hut about 50 meters from the body, and the surrounding area was dense with vegetation, he said, describing the setting as being similar to an abandoned oil palm plantation. Chong said the party delegated one of the seasoned hikers to contact the authorities because their mobile coverage was poor at the location. 
Without approaching the body, the group then waited for an hour to two before help finally arrived. When asked if it was difficult for a seasoned hiker to reach the location where Quarren's body was found, Chong replied in the affirmative as there were no visible hiking trails. Just more bizarreness to this. We're not talking about a trail that's cut and a teenage girl stumbling around out there. I mean, how did she get there? And and of course, with so little um, cuts to her feet, abrasions to her body, I, I don't know. Over at BBC.com, Inspector Noor Adil said the first of two emails demanding Bitcoin in ransom was sent to Noor's family on the 7th of August. He felt the emails were a scam and not from kidnappers. The email demanded two Bitcoins, about 20,000 pounds sterling, and said, you have until 8 p.m. Moscow time. He said he did not try to identify the email sender at the time. This was a task given to another officer. Uh, I've seen other updates on that, that they did try to track down the where the email came from and the account had been closed by the time they were tracking it. Based on the email sent, I found the pattern used by the sender of the email leans towards a modus operandi used by scammers. They will provide the time, provide the wallet address, ask for the amount, and they will threaten what will happen if you do not pay up. But the sender of the mail, we don't know who it is. Uh, He also did something kind of interesting. He actually put some money into that Bitcoin account and then traced it where it went. Um, And it bounced through several different accounts. And I think it wound up in Virginia here in the U.S. somehow. At least that's the last step in where they were able to trace it. Who knows where it could have gone from there or... If it does wind up in Virginia, who's accessing it from a different account and then pulling it out somewhere else in the world? I don't know. Mother heard voices in chalet on the morning daughter disappeared. Um, So this is more current information. We're literally getting to articles that are just from the last few days now. Maeve Corrin, who is originally from Belfast, told an inquest into her 15-year-old daughter's death that she believed she heard muffled and whispering sounds of two people inside the family's cottage The morning Nora Ann Corrin disappeared, but she took no action because she was asleep and not fully conscious at the time. Ms. Corrin said police were more focused on search and rescue and only started looking for fingerprints and interviewing resort staff several days later, by which time many people had passed through the property. Um, You know, the information that we're getting from the detectives is that they actually did pull those prints on the same day. I don't know why there's a discrepancy there, but the family's saying that didn't happen until several days later. She told the inquest by video link from her London home, I believe that criminal evidence, if it existed, would have been lost during that time. And she means the gap between when the missing person was reported and uh, three days later, essentially. Ms. Corrin and her French husband, Sebastian Corrin, said Nora was kidnapped because she had mental and physical disabilities and could not have wandered off on her own. Ms. Corrin broke down at one point during her four hours of evidence at the inquest. She spoke at length about Nora's disability, saying it would be almost impossible for her daughter, who weighs, I believe she's just over 60 pounds, to push open and climb out of a window with her limited strength and disability. The children were sleeping in the loft while she and her husband were in the master bedroom downstairs, Miss Corrin said, adding that her younger daughter woke up near dusk to go to the toilet and noticed that Nora was already missing, but thought she had gone to sleep with her parents. She said Nora would not have necessarily cried for help because she was highly submissive, which could prove why there were no marks or struggle on her body. She would just be silent and stare at the floor and close in on herself, she said. Why does her state of body not reflect that of someone constantly moving or exposed to the harshest of elements, her mother said. Her mother also talked about that she's trying to not speculate on the motivation for the abduction because she believes whatever the original intent was changed when the news of the abduction and the response started. That basically if someone had abducted her for something in particular, once they saw the level of attention that was going on, that they could have just released her just to try to get clear of the situation. I I think it's a possibility, but it's still one of those things where we've got to find the physical evidence that supports that in some way. Um, Thinking about the dog and the fact that they couldn't detect her scent from between the house to the gate, could it be that she was carried from that location 
and that's why her scent isn't available there. I, I just, I don't know. It's tough because I'm, I'm finding pieces that support. There's really two sides to this. You've got the investigator saying, no, we think that she did it on her own. She crawled out the window. She did that. But then we've got problems with that story because of information we're getting from the scent dogs, uh, even the fingerprint analysis not really being conducted right uh, or not that's not conducted right. It's not really conclusive. They did reach out to, um, I think they reached out to both because her passport was from Ireland, but they also checked in France. They did get some fingerprints of hers, but it was only of two of her fingers and they tried to match those. They couldn't match those with those other three unknown prints. So, and the fact that they couldn't match those three unknown prints. That means you, you've got someone else in consideration here that wasn't part of their initial group of 20 people that they had fingerprinted. There, there's someone else. There's something else at play. But this is a bungalow. This is rented by other people. Is there former people that stayed there that maybe touched the window? So many considerations on this case. I really don't know which way to go with it. Uh, now, as of when I'm recording this, the father has just testified as well. And he's essentially echoing the same story as the mother, but he's saying he heard some strange sounds too. The teen's father claims heard muffled sounds from within chalet. The father of French-Irish teenager Nora Ann Corrin told the coroner's court today, after three to four hours of heavy sleep, I was woken up in the early part of night by an outside noise, which I believe came from a nearby chalet where they seemed to be having a party. Later in the night, I heard a muffled noise. I can't describe what noise it was because I was in a semi-conscious state that seemed to be coming from the chalet. I'm, a, I'm just a little bothered by the phrasing is almost exactly like what his wife is saying. Well, I was semi-conscious. I, I couldn't understand. He's like literally saying the same thing. But I also get, you know, I've taken vacations. I've stayed in other places. The first night you sleep somewhere else. I mean, think about it for yourself. Have you ever had an instance where you stayed somewhere else and for the first night there was some weird sound and it kind of woke you up or in the in a light sleep, you're like, hey, what is that? That's kind of a regular occurrence, at least for me personally. Of course, I think, you know, they're looking for anything to help them understand what happened to their daughter at this point. I'm just wondering if they're focusing on this too hard. I don't know. I can feel it was close, but I cannot describe the nature of it, he said during the inquest. He was later asked whether such an occurrence was a security concern to him, to which Felipe, which I think that's his his original last name, uh, replied negatively as he did not get out of bed, but added that they felt like movement and whispers. Felipe also recalled the unusualness of Nora's physical condition, in particular the soles of her feet during his visit to the pathologist to give his permission for an autopsy to be conducted when she was found. He saw her feet and noticed that her feet didn't seem to be particularly damaged. In fact, the same, just dirty. How is it possible since the police told us Nora had been on the move for seven days, he said, adding that such circumstances did not seem to match the scenario of someone wandering around a jungle half naked with bare feet. Uh, and then he and his wife also tapped on the authorities failing to take matters as urgently as they thought they should. Um, it, it's basically the exact same points that his wife raised as well. So uh, I'm just really heartbroken for the family. There, there is no good outcome. I want them to find what they're looking for, but I don't know that like, I don't know what proof you could give them at this point of, yes, there was an abduction and here is the path to justice. The pieces that we've got, there are so many strange conditions with, but they're all leaving me just stuck in the middle and I don't know which way to push on it. You know, I, I, I get where the investigators are coming from based on the information they've presented. I get where the family is coming from based on the information that they've presented. But if I've ever seen something that I would consider a stalemate for any case that I've looked at on this channel, man, does this hit it? Like, I just, I don't know. I don't know how you move the needle on this case. Um, a family of a missing person being upset at how law enforcement is processing their case. 
I hear about that practically on a daily basis. There's nothing very strange about that. The conditions around the disappearance, the conditions around the investigation, it, there's a lot that is to be debated there. And I'm thankful that at least they are doing the inquest. They are going through this process. I just don't know how it comes out. So you guys are now current with this as well. You can follow along with the articles as they come out from here forward or wait for another update episode. Um, you know, considering that I think we've only heard from about half the witnesses, I'm 95% sure that we're going to have another episode with a bunch of other considerations for this case. Is that going to help us move the needle? Uh, I don't know. I, I want to know, is there a search for justice that has to happen here? And how can we help facilitate that? I just don't know if we're there yet. And uh, boy, am I scratching my brain on this case. I want to thank several people who are supporting the channel through Patreon now. Thank you, new patrons, Tracy, Karen, and Jana. If you'd like to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon, or buy merchandise. Speaking of which, the merch store has been completely redesigned and there's some new products there. We've got a new case cracked design. We've got Seriously Mysterious merch there now as well. So please check that out. Help support the channel. Keep us with limited commercials and keep me spending time here with you. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel.